I don't know what's going on, but it is the year of bringing back classics and spiritual successors, and I am here for it. Live Alive, a game that never made it to the West, has finally arrived in all of its HD 2D glory. I was so fearful that Live Alive was going to be stomped out and forgotten because of the monster JRPG that is Xenoblade Chronicles 3. But I am here to bring it to the forefront of your mind. Oh here I present you several delightful and unique short stories over various time periods. You have seven stories to start with, and unlocking more after you beat others. Each story has a mechanic that is limited to a particular story. You can pick any fable you fancy, but for this review, I'm going to start with the order I went in. I began, well, in the beginning. Prehistory. You're Pogo, a caveman who helps save a girl who's meant to be a sacrifice from another tribe. This feels like a classic, fun story of saving a damsel just in the Paleolithic period. What's so unique here is there is no dialogue and you'll be following your nose to get around, which seems detrimental considering how much flatulence these cave folk can unleash. <laughs> Imperial China originally did not interest me at first. I decided to play one that interests me, one that doesn't. One does, one doesn't. And I was completely blown away. Easily one of the best stories about an old Shifu who wants to pass on his arts. So he finds three pupils to train and carry out his legacy. This mechanic is picking your favorite and training them up as the next Shifu. Imperial China was amazing for several reasons. One, you start as a master, so you have this mini power trip of felling bandits with ease. Two, is how in such a short period of time, how quickly I've fallen in love with my pupils. Not only that, this is one of the few stories that has multiple endings depending on how you play. The Far Future, one I was mistakenly interested in. This one was an experience. You're a little round robot named Cube, and you make coffee, that's it. You're aboard a ship, okay? A large ship, okay? Lots of connecting hallways, okay? A quiet ship. Only sound you're hearing is the hum of the machinery, okay? And you're transporting a giant monster. Oh shit, I know where this is going. Yup, surprise, there's a fucking horror game spliced into this otherwise happy, adventurous game. Wouldn't it be a shame if the monster escaped and if you ran into it, you would land an instant game over since you're only good for making coffee? And that's that story's mechanic. Hated it, bottom tier. Naturally, I needed something way more uplifting and fun, and what other place than to let loose and get wild than the Wild West? You're a lone gunslinger, and along with an old rival, you both help a town troubled by outlaws known as the Crazy Bunch. Rather than take on the whole pack, you work with the town to create traps, eliminating as many outlaws before they arrive at the saloon. The less traps you lay out, the harder it will be to take down the Crazy Bunch. This route is fantastic, a lot of fun, with a creative spin on tackling the final boss, and multiple endings. And can I just say, I appreciated some of the liberties they took with the translation. You can't stomach it, lest it's fresh from your mother's tits. Your mother's, maybe. I wanted more of this raw, unfiltered dialogue expected in the Wild West. In the near future, a troubled youth who can read people's minds finds himself in the middle of a conspiracy. This was a weird shonen feeling anime story. You got this gang of motorcyclists kidnapping people for some wild experiment, which ultimately leads you to the Steel Titan to put an end to this madness. This was fun in a weird way, it was very quirky, and here we utilize the mind reading mechanic allowing you to glean information from friend and foe. Now if none of that convinces you to give this story a go, maybe having a robot turtle as a companion will. Now let's take it back to Edo Japan, where you're a shinobi tasked with saving a prisoner. Another story with several endings depending on how you play. Kill everyone in this castle, kill no one in this castle, kill here and there, Kill the men first, then the women, or something else. I went the pacifist route, sneaking past everyone and killing no one, while keeping track of the bell, symbolizing the changing of passwords of protected doors. Save and save often. This is by far the most frustrating one, as some of the rooms have optional bosses that you cannot flee from, ultimately demanding you kill them and ruin your pacifist run. Killing everyone is equally as frustrating, as if you kill someone too soon, it won't prompt other people to arrive. Going the pacifist route, thankfully I could still get a taste of bloodshed by fighting anything non-human. This is lower on my list because it was easy to get lost in the constant running away or reloading save files, never mind the missable party member necessary for a pacifist run. And finally, here we are, present day, the shortest of the routes as it's merely a tournament about a man who wants to put his strength to the test. 
It's back-to-back -back fighting. Bait your foes into using their special moves and learn it yourself. A freakishly fun mechanic, probably my favorite mechanic in the entire game. So simple, yet so rewarding. Complete all seven stories to unlock an eighth. The Middle Ages, which is by far the longest and harkens back to the quintessential JRPG. A hero who wins a contest and a princess's hand in marriage. But in that time, the Dark Lord has arisen and his minions capture the princess. And thus begins a classic heroic tale. Save for the far future and sadly probably the shinobi route, I think the stories were so enjoyable. And if for some reason you aren't enjoying these stories, you can quit and start a new chapter and come back to the old story at any time. These tales are like if JRPGs cut out all the fetch questy bullshit or typical time consuming bits and only had the meat and potatoes of the story. Leveling up is quick and you learn a skill almost each level, which makes it feel that much more rewarding. Plus, you automatically heal after every battle. The convenience is amazing. I was taken back by each and every story in different ways. And the scope was incredible. For the SNES? Pfft. Hidden bosses, hidden dungeons, hidden dialogue? You get a different kind of enjoyment from different runs, different choices, and different discoveries. Combat throughout all the stories are more or less the same. The only exceptions are what I detailed while explaining the stories. Prehistory has a smelling mechanic, near future you read minds, shinobi you can hide from enemies, etc. The core combat is you're on a grid with a bar displaying when you can act. Any movement causes the bar to fill for enemies and allies alike. Once it's your turn to act, you can use a skill, which all have different ranges. Some have an area of effect, some give status effects or change the terrain. You can see how much damage and how quickly it takes to set off a skill. Some take so long they get a red charging bar. You'll notice some enemies are vulnerable to certain skills, while others are resistant and will take significantly less damage. Counters are also a thing, so be wary of those, as some attacks you'll want to make sure that you kill rather than injure. Also, some enemies roll in packs, and if you take out their leader, you automatically clear the board. Aside from that, move to attack, sometimes it's best to move away, baiting your enemy to waste time moving rather than attacking. You can wait, meaning do nothing and the bar fills, pass, which goes to the next person who bars filled, use an item, and flee. When an ally's HP reaches zero, they'll faint. Any item that restores HP will bring them back. But if they're hit again while they're down, they are permanently out of the fight. It's a very simple combat system, quick to learn and easy to master. Exploration is pretty basic as well. Anything that sparkles is something to be investigated. A very simplistic mapping system. Gold icons or a flag are where you need to go. Blue icons means you've already been there and gray means you haven't. If you don't know, Live Alive is a gorgeous remaster of the SNES version. It is I wouldn't know how anyone would want to play the SNES version. Once again, Square's out here with that sweet HD 2D pixel style that is timeless. With Octopath, Triangle Strategy, Live Alive, and with Octopath 2 on the horizon, man, they have perfected the style. I love the blurred backgrounds, the glow of the sun and moon, the gentle fog, how developed the background feels, and even the clean text. I appreciate how faithful it is to the original. To me, the most beautiful is the shinobi level. There's nothing like running along the rooftops with the highest point of the temple in the distance with this gorgeous purple glow. These characters themselves are beautiful and so damn expressive. The prehistoric era excels in this. The cavemen laughing or getting angry cracks me up. Also, when the lighting reflects on the characters, I gasped. I was so taken back. Just looking at how smooth the animations are. It's mind blowing to me how much they redid. Even the characters are less SNES chibi and more fleshed out while still keeping the spirit of the original. Also shout out to the updated art. Listen, I grew up on the 90s classic anime vibe and I'll always have a love for it no matter how ugly at times it may seem. But the art absolutely took a step in the right direction with the guidance of the great Naoki Ikushima, mainly known for Bravely Default, Octopath, and Triangle Strategy. Naoki Ikushima isn't the only legendary talent in this game. Yoko Shimomura, who composed the original SNES soundtrack of Live Alive, has returned. Her music has been remastered for the remake, and it's pretty on point. Square took down the remaster OST from YouTube, so I have been listening to the compressed SNES versions, and frankly, they're both amazing, incredible, spectacular, you can't really go wrong with either or. Each story has their own area themes, battle themes, but they all have the same final boss theme. Also, we have English and Japanese voice acting, or you can turn it off if it ain't your jam. I always welcome voice acting, no matter how terrible it is. And Live Alive had a few hiccups here and there, but overall, I liked it. I do wish the voice and the text boxes lined up, 
That's honestly my one pet peeve, but nothing major at all. Mind giving sleep and beauty here a swift kick to get him up and moving? Now, all the music is great, but I have to give it to Edo Japan. That entire era drops fire beats. And what's incredible is the SNES version still stands on its own. The Shinobi's route is easily the most annoying, but the song, The Sound of Shinobi, made it bearable. As adults, it's nice that Live Alive has short stories, easy to pick up at any time and place. It scratches that JRPG itch by playing an hour, hour and a half long JRPG. It was incredible for 1994 and it's incredible in 2022. It's something different, refreshing, and fun. Please, please, please play Live Alive. This game has something for everyone. You like fighting games? Got you. You like horror? Got you. You like mechas? Gotcha. You like, I don't know, horses? Well, we got that too. You will want for nothing, and I truly hope this trend of releasing Japanese exclusive RPGs to the West continues. Thank you all so much for watching, and be sure to click the top or bottom box for more reviews like this one. I appreciate you all so much, and also don't forget to consider joining my Patreon, where we play Among Us in the Discord, you guys can get postcards and early access depending on what tier you like. I appreciate all of your support, and I'll see you in the next video. Mwah.